The authorship of the Zoharic literature has been disputed over the centuries. Did Rav Cook have a view on the matter? What I can tell you regarding this matter is the following. Many years ago, approximately 30 years ago, I was uh, in the National Library in Givath Ram in Yerushalayim, in Jerusalem. Within the National Library, uh, there is a smaller library, a separate uh, room, small hall, which is a library dedicated to uh, all manner of literature pertaining to Kabbalah, to Jewish mysticism. The, this library is uh, known as the Gershon Sholem Library after the, uh, one of the uh, major uh, academics uh, who essentially invented this field of research many years ago and was active in the Hebrew University uh, in Givath Aram in, in Jerusalem. I was in this library and I was uh, perusing different texts that one can find there and all of a sudden I saw stuck between uh, two volumes, a, a very, very thin and uh, unimpressive looking uh, work of some kind. This um, turned out to be, when I pulled it out, it turned out to be exactly three photocopied pages uh, which had been stapled into uh, and bound with uh, a, a very, uh, a fairly thin type of cardboard. And on the outside it said, in, in the following words, it just said, Mewhas la Rav Kook. The, the, the writing here or the text herein is um, attributed to Rav Kook. So I, of course, immediately opened it up. I wished to see what it was all about. And I found uh, these three pages, and I have them in, in my hand. Immediately having read the, the, con the contents, I immediately asked permission to photocopy these pages, and I received such permission, and I photocopied them, and here they are. These are the photocopies I made about 30 years ago. We're talking about three pages, as one can see. One, two, three pages, that's all. That's what I found in this, uh, stapled into this uh, cardboard binding. And as soon as I looked at the handwriting, what we have here are three handwritten pages, I immediately knew this was not the handwriting of Rav Cook because I am familiar with the, writing, the handwriting of Rav Cook. It is easy to become familiar with his writing because it has been reproduced in many places, in different books and works of his and others, on top of which I have in my possession uh, S certain uh, books of his writings in the original copies of the original manuscript. So I'm very familiar with Rav Cook's handwriting. And these, these pages are not written in his handwriting. Anyone who wishes to zoom in and have a look can see. And we will, uh, I think, also publish a scanned version of these pages so that uh, people can look for, see for themselves. First of all, I read the contents, which I will presently convey to you. And then, of course, I asked myself the question, who wrote these words, because it's clearly, clearly not the writing of Rav Cook. And then I began to notice that I had seen uh, such handwriting elsewhere, previously. And when I went home, the first thing I did was to pull out uh, certain writings of uh, Harav Dawid Kohen, the Nazir, uh, one of the greatest students, perhaps the greatest student and uh, disciple of, of Rav Kook. It was, after all, to the Nazir uh, that Rav Kook handed the famous Shwanak Kvatsim, the famous uh, eight um, books of manuscript, of his own manuscript. He handed these to the Nazir and asked him to edit them and publish them as he saw fit. And this is uh, eventually, this is what became known as the Rotha Kodesh. Uh, so I immediately compared the handwriting in these pages to the handwriting that one that one can see in some of the uh, 
some of the writings of, of, uh, of the Nazir, where some of his handwriting was reproduced, and immediately became apparent that this was his handwriting. There's no question, it's exactly the same handwriting. That's with regards to what I found and where I found it. And I should mention at this point also that um, I've never seen any mention of these pages and, and the contents thereof anywhere at all. I honestly do not know uh, for a fact whether the contents of these pages is widely known. In fact, I'm sure it's not widely known. I'm not sure if it is known at all, even in uh, certain academic circles perhaps that deal with, tend to deal with these issues. I can imagine that uh, one can assume, I think, that some people must be aware of its existence, but I've never seen it mentioned. Certainly I've never heard it spoken of in uh, the circles which, which uh, identify and uh, study the writings of Rav Kook. During the ten years that I studied in Mekazarav, I never heard mention of such a thing. And uh, I think it will, will become apparent to you as soon as I explain what, is, what we find herein, why this is so. I will read uh, a few lines from the three pages here, and then I will explain. It says as follows in Hebrew, Hatikunim v'chen raya mehemana hem giluim elyonim bilshonam mamash miruho v'nishmato sherashbi u'moshe. The first statement here says that the uh, those parts of the Zoharic literature known as the Tikkunim, Tikkunei Zohar, and the Raya Mehemana, which are two separate works, which are part of the general Zoharic literature. The Zohar is not a book or one book, it's not one text. What people generally loosely refer to as the Zohar is actually made up of many, many texts, perhaps uh, as many as 15 in number. And uh, the Tikkunei Zohar on the one hand and the Raya Mehemana on the other hand are specific texts separate from the uh, other parts that are of the text that are generally referred to as the Zohar. Um, that is how they appear, for example, uh, even in, in many of the printed versions as a separate text under a separate heading. And we have also the, uh, the Perush, the commentary of the Ramak, Rabbi Moshe Kodivero, on the Zohar and, uh, and the Tikkunei Zohar and the Raya Mehemana and his commentary is, is uh, uh, divided according to the different books of the Zohar. So the commentary on the Tikkunei Zohar is a, is a separate entity altogether from his commentary on the Zohar itself. And it's important to note this fact that what it sp speaks of here is the Tikkunim, Tikkunei Zohar and the Raya Mehemana. What we are about to hear now refers to these two texts. What it states here is that these texts were received or were, as it were, tr conveyed uh, in, in the actual words which we find before us today from the neshama, the soul of Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai and Moshe Rabbeinu, Raya Mehemana refers to Moshe Rabbeinu, and that is how they, that is their provenance. They emanate from, from that source, but in real historical terms on this earth, they were not recorded, they were not even received uh, during the time of the Mishnah, before the period of the Mishnah which is the time of Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai. Rather, he goes on to say here, Omnam babshat ba'olam ha'asiyah, here in this world, harayhem nikhtavu bide sadiqim u'kadoshim ahronim bizman mu'uhar. But in practice, in terms of historical reality, they were written down uh, at a much later date. The later date being referred to uh, is mentioned uh, later on the... Uh, on the second page, where he speaks of Rabbanim Svaradiim besignona mehkara Svaradi uvilshon hadarshanim. That is how. That is that is why the style and the language is 
similar to that of uh, certain Svaradi uh, Chachamim of that period. We're talking about the 13th century according to the Christian calendar in Spain, where the, which is it's known that this is where these texts first came to light. What the Nazir is suggesting is that the famous debate that has been raging for centuries, namely whether these texts uh, came into being and existed here on, uh, on this earth, going back to the time of Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai and his students and his students' students, which means we're talking about uh, over 1800 years ago and 1700 years ago, etc. Or whether they were written by certain uh, mystics, Rabbanim in Spain in the Middle Ages, in the 13th century. This debate, according to the Nazir, what he writes here is to be resolved uh, in the following manner. On the one hand, they were written down in this world in the 13th century. That is true. He admits this fact. And he explicitly makes mention on the second page uh, of the Ya'abes. He writes, Ukvar diber al gaon ba'al mitpahat sefarim. This is a book, Mitpahat Sefarim, which is almost unknown nowadays uh, because it was deliberately uh, quashed and hidden by many people over the last uh, many generations since the time of its appearance and the, during the uh, uh, 18th century. Uh, according to the Christian calendar, that's when the Ya'abes, Rabbi Ya'akov ben Svi uh, Mi'enden, uh, that's, when, that's when he lived. And he wrote a book called Mitpahat Safarim where he discusses this very issue of the providence of the Zoharic literature. And it should be pointed out that the Abbas on the one hand, and Rav Kook and the Nazir, we'll get to Rav Kook in a moment, on the other hand, were, uh, were all great mystics and uh, all their lives studied Kabbalah. We're not talking about individuals who had no use for Kabbalah, who rejected Kabbalah out of hand. And yet, they also understood, based on the linguistic style and many expressions that are found in these texts, they understood that it's impossible that they should have been written in ancient times. And therefore the Abbas uh, reaches a, similar, a very similar conclusion to what we read here. And uh, the Nazir makes a mention of this fact. And he ends that paragraph, speaking of the Nazir, as, with the words, Udvaro emeth wasadak umehem al tazuz. That's what the Nazir writes. There are a couple of uh, points to be stressed here before we continue. And that is, that the Nazir is not, I repeat, not speaking of the Zoharic literature as a whole. As I mentioned, the Zohar, or as it's loosely referred to as the Zohar, is made up of many different texts from uh, not necessarily the same period of time, and not, certainly not from the same author, and not in the same language either. Uh, what is being referred to here specifically are two well-known texts within that general literature, namely the Tikkun Zohar and the Raya Mehemana. These texts, these two texts, have always been understood, have been recognized by, by those with understanding to be on a very different level, on a much higher level than uh, the general Zoharic literature. In other words, the Zohar itself is of a much lower level. This is not my uh, personal opinion. This is something which is well known and has been stated by uh, many, many uh, great Mekubalim, mystics and uh, Rabbanim who, have, who were expert in, in these fields. It is no accident, for example, that we have a commentary of Perush of the Gra, the Golmi Vilna, on the Tikkun Zohar, specifically on the Tikkun Zohar, not on the Zohar as a whole, because these were this was a particular, particularly profound and, and important text in his eyes. It's also a fact that uh, Rabbi Nachman Breslev uh, makes mention of the fact that uh, in, he in fact is, is quoted as having expressed surprise 
that uh, people in general spoke of the Zohar and the Tikkun Zohar in the same breath uh, without distinguishing between them and uh, he, he points out that they're really totally different on totally different levels of uh, depth and, uh, and uh, insight uh, and yet he says people don't seem to understand this fact but again this was understood by many people so we're talking here specifically about the Tikkun Ezra and the Raya Mehemana. If the Nazir makes this claim uh, with regards to these two texts specifically, it is clear, it, is, it follows, that uh, if he singled, he chose to single these texts out, he, that it follows that he's not referring to all of the Zayak literature as a whole, uh, in other words, if he felt that these very, very profound and, and uh, um, texts from, a, from, as it were, from a very high place in terms of their uh, spiritual level were not written 1800 years ago in practice, but, uh, but in the 13th century in Spain, it follows that he would say obviously the same or, or more with regards to what we generally refer, refer to as the Zohar in general. In other words, it can only be uh, even more obvious that this is what he would uh, hold, or this is what he would suggest with regards to other parts of the Zoharic literature. What is very important to note is that at the bottom of the second page, the Nazir writes, Yesod ha-devarim kibalti mi pimaran shlita. The uh, essential ideas here that I'm writing here, right, says the Nazir, I received mipim maran shlita from Maran. It is clear that, that there is only one person in the world that the Nazir would have referred to uh, using such language, and that is Rav Kook, generally widely known both then and today as Maran Harav Kook. And there's no question that he referred to Rav Kook as Maran Shlita, as we see in some of his writings. And uh, therefore, what we have before us is uh, an account, a written account, in the, in the handwriting, in the very hand of the Nazir, based on a conversation or conversations that he had with uh, of Cook on this issue. It goes without saying, I, I believe that uh, many people hearing this will understand, will appreciate that there are many people who are generally identified with and associated with Rav Kook and his writings who either do not, are not aware of this text that I have before me, have never seen it, as I say, I've never, I never heard of it mentioned or spoken of anywhere at all to this day. Uh, A, many people are not familiar with this text. B, some may be there may be certain individuals within the Rav Kook camp, shall we say, those who claim to be uh, his uh, disciples and to continue his work. There may be some who have seen it or are aware of it, but uh, would be very, very displeased if, the, if this information were to get out. In other words, if they could, as with the writings of Rav Kook himself, and we know this for a fact, that... Uh, there still are in existence today many writings of Rav Kook that have never been published because there are individuals, uh, particular certain well-known individuals, Rabbanim, who make it their business to deny access to these writings of Rav Kook to the general public and even to a very limited public uh, for, for their own uh, reasons which we don't necessarily have to go into right here but they, they feel obviously that uh, it is better that people not know everything that Rav Kook thought and wrote. I obviously do not think so. I do not believe that this for one moment. I do not believe that Rav Kook uh, spent his life writing all that material so that it would eventually uh, be uh, eaten by my mice in some, in some uh, attic or some uh, warehouse and, uh, and crumble into dust, which is in fact what more or less has already happened to some of the earlier writings of Rav Kook from going back uh, 120 years or so. Some of those um, early manuscripts have in fact uh, reached the point where they are nearly illegible but for, for these very reasons. 
which is of course a great tragedy. So there are definitely many people who A, do not know what Rev. Cook wrote on this or spoke or said about this matter, and if they were to know, they would be uh, the first to wish to hide this information from from the Jewish people and from the world, which I believe is is most certainly uh, a misguided approach, to say the least. And and therefore, I choose to make this knowledge and this information public. And I have the written text in front of me again. Anyone who wishes to examine it uh, and uh, see for himself the veracity of what I have read from it. I can't read all the words, all the text. As I said, there are two and uh, two pages and, and a third page as well. He also speaks here about the Ramchal. Uh, perhaps on another occasion I will uh, quote other statements from, this, from these few pages. But the essential message is that Rav Kook and the Nazir were, on the one hand, great mystics, Mukubalim, who believed in the essential truth of the Kabbalah, on the one hand. On the other hand, they were also uh, well-versed in the realities of literary styles and uh, expressions and language that we find in different periods, and that one can, without doubt, identify uh, the time period and the provenance of, of a text based on those indications of language, expression, and style. And they were familiar with the writings of the Abbas, as we mentioned, who wrote the Mitpah Seferim, a book on this very subject, which was quashed and hidden and not spoken about and has not is generally today unknown. I, of course, do have both a photocopy of the uh, one of the original printings of that book, plus uh, one of my teachers, Rabbi Ben Sion Kohen Zetzal, who taught me uh, what I know regarding the Shona Kodesh, that is to say the correct pronunciation of the Hebrew language, he uh, reprinted a new, uh, very clean and uh, easy to read and well, well, uh, well, uh, very well typeset and uh, produced version, uh, edition of, of this book, Mitpah al-Sifarim by the Abbas, uh, a short time before he passed away, which I also have. Again, unfortunately, many, many people never even heard of this book of the Abbas, which is a great pity. What we see from all of this is that many great people who were great Mekubalim were able and willing to deal with issues and questions regarding the provenance of these texts. And this, uh, this approach uh, regarding some of these texts at least, that is to say the Tikkunim and the Rayam Mehemana, we see here a, a sophisticated and uh, not, not, at, not at all as a simplistic approach and understanding of the matter at hand. I'm not suggesting that anyone has to accept uh, necessarily this position, this understanding, but it is certainly uh, something that many people would not have believed for a moment that Rav Kook would have thought or could have thought, or could have imagined, and yet we see this is so. And this is, uh, uh, by the way, something that, that can be said in relation to many, many things that Rav Cook thought and said. There are many people today who believe they know who Rav Cook was and what he thought, and that they have a handle on uh, what made Rav Cook tick, so to speak. Uh, but in fact, they know often precious little about the true Rav Kook and, and the breadth and depth of his thoughts and his ideas and how, how uh, out of the box he, he truly was. And this is just one, uh, one more example of this fact. Thank you, Rabbi Bar Chaim. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. We would also like to suggest the following opportunity to our viewers. If you identify with Rabbi Bar Chaim's message and would like to sponsor or dedicate a video interview with the rabbi in honor or memory of a loved one, if you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, 
please email us at office at machonchilo.org.